Hello, and welcome to episode 420 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many others. How are you, Bill, on this 1st of October? Yeah, Seth, I'm ready to, you know, for us to get into another uplifting episode. Mm. Uh, my goodness, but war is never uplifting, is it? Yeah. It is not. And uh, this, well, these last few about Okinawa have not been exactly um, sunshine and rainbows. No, no. Mm. And uh, next week's is even going to be even more uplifting than this week's. So just buckle yeah. up. Mm. No. Clearly, our third member of our crew is here, John Parshall, historian John Parshall. How are you this week, John? And I believe you have an announcement you want to make, too. So I do. How, yeah. First of all, how are you doing today? I'm very well. Thank you. It's uh, starting to turn a little cooler here and uh, good biking weather, which is always great for me and honorable waifu. So, uh, yeah, um, I was just going to say that I have uh, been working to put up a placeholder website. As you know, many of our viewers know, I've been working on this 1942 monstrosity for the last umpty years, and it's getting much closer to being done. So I've got a website, and the URL will be uh, posted below. But um, I just wanted to say that if anybody has enjoyed the work that I've done here uh, with my buddies on Unauthorized and like that kind of an approach to history, I would be thrilled if you would be so kind as to put your email address into the mailing list on that website so that I could start capturing that data for potential publishers. That would really help me out. So thanks very much in advance. I have and if I could strong. translate, yeah, John's word monstrosity, yeah. that means book, folks. Book. So. <laughs> Yeah. In case so, you were wondering. <laughs> just just to be explicit about that. So this is a new history of the year 1942, basically talking about how the Allies turned around their train wrecks that year. And when I say Allies, I mean all of them. So this covers the entire war, all theaters for the 13 months from December 41 to December 42 inclusive. Uh, and it's a so it's a pretty big topic, uh, but I, I think it's uh, it's going to be really interesting. I have a strong feeling that you're going to get a very good response out of this crowd. I could be wrong, but I have a strong feeling you will. I hope so. Yeah, uh, I appreciate it. I think you, yeah. think you will. Thank you. Will. And I just want to make a note, too. Um, and this has nothing to do with uh, the podcast. It's just a personal thing. Last week, um, Hurricane Helene hit Florida mm. and just absolutely ravaged Florida and Tennessee and North and Carolina, Carolina and Georgia and all points between and beyond. And I have friends up there. I have some family near there and everybody's that I know is okay, but there's a lot of people that have died. And I just want to say as a hurricane veteran myself of Katrina and many others, my heart goes out to you, poor people. Good God. May God have mercy on your souls and everything in between. It, it's unbelievable. And you have my deepest, deepest sympathy. And if there's any way, uh, you know, if people want to give to 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 local organizations to help these poor people out, please do so, myself included. I'm going to do the very same thing because I know how it is. I truly, truly do. Um, and yeah. God bless you all. And I know there's a lot of people who watch and listen to this show that are affected by this. So our hearts and uh, thoughts definitely go out to you guys and gals because it's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, Seth, you know, I'm on the Atlantic side of Florida. We We just got a little bit of rain. It hardly mm -hmm. affected us at all. So many people reaching out saying, hey, you guys OK? And we were just fine, which is really it was agonizing to watch what was happening in the panhandle, the, you know, the, the, the big bend of bend, Florida yeah. and parts yeah. north. And so, my goodness, it, you know, I've got friends that went out there in the middle of a storm, knowing that they would need to help. And, you know, God bless everybody that's doing prayers go out to all of the affected folks. You know. Okay, well, on with today's. If that wasn't in lift, uplifting enough, here we go. <laughs> so I follow steel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Following the abandonment of K Kakazu Ridge defensive network, the capture of Hacksaw Ridge, and the insertion of the Marine Corps into the front line, the American advance on Okinawa proceeded to gain steam, right? 
wrong. Mm-hmm. The campaign, the campaign ashore on Okinawa was proving to be a meat grinder. Two American infantry divisions, the 96th and the 27th Infantry Division of the United States Army, had worn themselves down to a shadow of their love day status. Their brothers in the 7th ID were not far behind them in that regard by May 1st, 1945. As a result, 10th Army Commanding General Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. decided to bring his two other infantry divisions south to enter the fray alongside the Army in its push towards what the Americans were now calling the Shuri Line. The veteran 1st Marine Division, the Old Breed, took the 27th Infantry Division's place on the front line. As the veteran Marines moved towards their positions, they came under intense Japanese shell fire, a fitting introduction to the party for the Peleliu veterans. Just days later, the division some ashore were calling the New Breed, the 6th Marine Division, inserted itself in the line alongside their 1st Division brothers for the steamroller plod down the island. The fighting on Okinawa that would consume the month of May would also consume tens of thousands of lives on both sides as the battle tore into human bodies and minds at places like Awacha, Takeshi, Wana, Half Moon, Horseshoe, and Sugarloaf. May would see the final Japanese offensive of World War II aimed at against American troops, monsoon rains that turned the battlefield into a quagmire and a seemingly unending uptick in the ferocity of the fighting that would harken back to the days in the trenches in France during World War I. Guys, April, which is what we covered last week, essentially, was, you know, uh, the slow plod, the meat grinder a- against the ridges. And, that, and there's more ridges to talk about here today. But May, I think when people think of Okinawa and the ground campaign, this is what they think of is this just quagmire of hell is yep. what this is. It, it's just it may is just may is worse than April, if you can believe that. Yeah, no, it really is, um, because we're not only pressing into the heart of the defensive network here in and around Shuri Castle. But yeah, the weather breaks and you're now in the middle of the rainy season here in southern Japan. And it is just, yeah, the combination of those two things makes for a battlefield that, uh, yeah, Dante himself would have uh, found difficult to imagine. And we're going to get into the muddy, gritty details here in just a yep. bit. So from April 25th to May the 3rd, American units made steady advances towards the Shuri defenses. Buckner, General Buckner, rearranged his front lines, bringing the 6th Marine Division down from the north to face Ushijima's western flank and replaced the weary 27th Infantry Division with the 1st Marine Division, as we just said. In the eastern sector, the 77th, the Statue of Liberty, moved up to give the weary 96th some rest. And the 96th had beaten themselves to death against Kakazu for weeks on, and these guys were just spent. While the 7th Infantry Division remained on the western flank of the United States Army sector, the American front now consisted of two Marine divisions and two Army divisions in the east, two two Marine divisions in the west and two Army divisions in the east. So when the bill, when the 1st Marine Division came up to relieve the 27th, they immediately walked in to it, didn't they? It. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's. Yeah, it was lead elements of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines and the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. As they came to the line, the Marines almost immediately came under fire. The Japanese Welcome Committee provided a severe shock to the new members of the old breed, the the 1st Marine Division, who had, as of the past month, been enjoying easy duty up north. As the Japanese artillery fire fell, the Marines scattered to the four winds, seeking shelter wherever they could find it. By the time the 5th Marines, that's 5th Marine Regiment, arrived to complete the relief of the 27th Division elements on 1st May, Japanese gunners supporting the veterans of the 62nd Infantry Division, Japanese 67th ID, were pounding anything that moved. To that end, General Del Val assumed command of the Western Zone in Okinawa here at 1400 on 1st May and issued orders for a major attack the next morning. That evening, a staff officer brought the general capture a captured general, Japanese map, fully annotated with American positions that included the Marine positions. And the Marines had just gotten there. With growing uneasiness, Del Val realized his op- opponents 
already knew where everybody was as they're about to enter this the fight seth yeah well i was i was going to say too delval of course is an artillery officer himself yes, he, he was the artillery commander on guadalcanal and now he's in command of first marine division and so yeah it had to be <laughs> rather disquieting to realize that to realize yeah that they've watched everything that we've done thus far and again that makes sense because the japanese are still in possession of shuri which is the highest point uh in this neck of the woods and so yeah they can see everything that the americans are doing at this point yeah we talked about that last week and 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 I th again i think it's it's important to reiterate john is as you move further south on okinawa the ground gradually gets higher and higher and higher so when you're at the shuri point shuri castle point you can look all the way down and see everything in between yeah so the japanese could see i mean they could see the marines coming long before the marines ever even got there so they knew yeah. they were coming. And a lot of the vegetation is gone at this point too mm -hmm. um you know, I don't know what exact percentage of the Japanese artillery park is still intact at this point. It's obviously still rather significant. They had about 200 pieces of 75 millimeter or larger, and a number of them are significantly larger. There's a lot of 150 millimeter stuff uh, here on this island that the Japanese are using. And yeah, they can still really bring the hurting down uh, in the artillery department. So on the second day of May, uh, just as Diwali uh, predicted or ordered, rather is a more appropriate term, the Marines did go into the attack. This is the first Marine regiment that goes into the attack here towards Awacha. Uh, and in that part of the island, it's, it's well, then it was broken country. It was relatively open in some spots and relatively concealed in others. Uh, as soon as the Marines moved out into the open, they came under absolute smothering artillery and machine gun fire uh, as Able Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, attempted to press their attack. No surprise here. Their casualties started to skyrocket. Um, they emerged near the southern side of the village of, what is it, John? Miyagi? I is think it's it? Miyagi, yeah. Miyagi? Okay, so I was looking at the wrong damn map again. Uh, the Marines went to ground and endured an absolute beating from mortars and artillery. A company CO noted that the ridge ahead of him and that uh, left his Marines in clear view of the enemy the entire time. Again, just reiterating exactly what we just said. They retreated under the cover of smoke, and the 1st Marine Division's first assault on Okinawa failed to make um, any more progress at all than the 27th had. So it just went yeah. right there and stopped right there. Yeah. So, right. yeah, big time. And as the Marines are starting to retreat, it begins to rain. Yes. And at this point, this isn't the monsoon that we know, but it's 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 coming. It's starting to begin to to fall in a more uh, regular fashion, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, the he heavy rain absolutely poured on these guys as they pulled back and continued through the night into the next morning. That night, in the pouring rain, elements of three one came under attack by Japanese infiltrators. John, you wanted to talk about the Japanese rain. Yeah, season. I was just yeah, I was just remembering uh, when my wife and I lived in Japan shortly after we got married, we moved over there in early March and you know started teaching and whatnot. And yeah, sometime in April, the the weather broke and the rainy season comes in and as a you know a good old minnesota boy i was just like are you kidding me is this what it's going to be like for the next however long because it just rains every freaking day and hard um so yeah it's just it's just a mess it's a mess and it's it's even worse down here on Okinawa because not only does it rain every day, but it's also a lot warmer already too. So yeah it's it's not a pleasant climate at all. And it's going to yeah, get real Seth, bad. I'll jump in too. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, this is this is not Seattle kind of rain, folks. This is you know monsoon. So what happens is, at first you'll get an afternoon of of heavy rain, and then it'll stop. Then you'll get a day of heavy yeah. rain, and it'll stop. And then when the monsoon absolutely hits you, bam! You know Vietnam vets will remember it well. I've been in the South Pacific as well. It just doesn't stop. It's like yeah. rain that you've never seen before. Yeah. Um, and, and it just doesn't stop. And so that's what we're talking about here. We're just in the beginning phase of that right now with yeah, the right. day or the afternoon. We'll talk about the absolute monsoon later this episode. Yeah. And, and we're making a big deal out of the rain because, you know, people are sitting there going, rain, it's just rain. Okay, first of all, number one, if you've ever been in the rain, 
like camping or anything else, that is literally one of the most nastiest, disgusting things you could possibly endure. It's miserable. Because <laughs> yeah. everything gets wet. I don't care yeah. if you set up your tent or your campsite in the most appropriate place. Eventually, everything is going to get wet. And you have to endure this as a Marine or a soldier on the line for well over a month. Yeah. Nonstop. So, I mean, it, it not only does it wear on, you know, your in equipment. Yeah, in a hole. Yeah, in a pool. Yeah, you're not getting you're not, what it is. Unless you're somebody that's significantly behind the lines, you're not going to be enjoying this in a shelter right. hat or something like that. You're going to be Hell enjoying no. this in a in a hole in the ground that's going to fill mm-hmm. up with water and you're going to be in it. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> this is poor as gum stuff. You know, it even rains from below. Right. <laughs> right. That's exactly yes. right. Indeed, indeed. Yep. And it wears on people. And that's that's the whole point. And we're going to get to that at the end later on. So Bob Craig, Robert Craig, a member of G Company, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, endured that night assault that we were just talking about a minute ago. He recalled, quote, things were fairly quiet for a while, nothing more than a few mortar or artillery shells. And then all of a sudden we heard these screams. It was so dark you could not see your hand in front of your face. And then everything got quiet. The next morning we found two of our men dead. They had been stabbed dozens of times in their foxholes. That woke us up quick. The 5th Marines were assailed by the Japanese infiltrators that night as well in a series of small assaults that broke down to, no surprise here, hand-to-hand fighting each time. The Marines were able to kill many of their attackers. Dead Japanese lay strewn across the battlefield, some with Marine K-bar sticking out of their chests, some disemboweled by bayonets. Others peppered with shrapnel from Marine grenades or hauled by rifle and machine gun rounds. As Marines behind the lines ran supplies up to the grunts on the front, one survivor, and I think this this surmises the entire campaign so perfectly, one survivor of the night action and a veteran from Peleliu was heard to tell his foxhole buddy about the upcoming campaign that he clearly was now involved in. He said, quote, this right here. Well, this is going to be a bitch, unquote. Yeah. I remember <laughs> from one of the interviews of Eugene Sledge that I've seen out on, on YouTube, he talks about, you know, what you would hear out in the foxholes at night. And, you know, when one of these infiltrators would get into the foxhole with a Marine or a couple of Marines, he's just like, it was just the most guttural, primitive, you know, grunts and, you know, God awful sounds until somebody, you know, is going to end up dead as a result of this. But yeah, just listening to that 20 feet that way and you can't do anything to intervene because if you get out of your hole, you're likely you're to get shot, too. Yep. So, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. You know, we, we probably ought to connect the dots because not everybody's going to connect. I uh, understand what you just said. Eugene Sledge, veteran of battle, Peleliu, wrote one of the best books ever, a Marine Corps in World War Two. And that yep, is. is. There it is. It, there it is. And yeah, and I know a lot of our folks. Yes, yeah, it's, it's one of Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just a great piece of literature. Um, he was a tremendous writer. And obviously, too, he was right in the thick of things in two of the most awful fights during this war. So, yeah, he's got a lot of mm-hmm. uh, very t- uh, trenchant things to say about this particular battle. Absolutely. Trenchant. Yeah, we'll be quoting him extensively. Anyway. Mm-hmm. So 1st Marine Division Commanding General Pedro de Valle, this you mentioned earlier, Bill, he ta- he took over 1st Marine Division from the, as I put in the notes, much disliked General Rupertus after Peleliu. Rupertus, of course, he was relieved after Peleliu, not, unfortunately, not because of Peleliu, but he also had bad health and he went home and yep. he wound up having a heart attack. He died. But Yes, he did. And yeah. Del, Del Valle is a different breed of cat entirely. He's one of these guys, too, that, that like you said, John, he was in charge of the 11th Marines during the Guadalcanal campaign. He he comes from the Vandergriff coaching tree, if you will. You're right. You know, and he's another Which one of these Rupertus old hard did line. did, too, of course. But, you know, Rupertus was a bust. Yes, um, he was. You know, it's it funny, sort of flashing back to some of the photographs of the the senior staff members of 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal is just like a who's who of, of cats that are going to go on to have, you know, they're all going to be colonels and generals and whatnot. And Rupertus, even back then, was the assistant commander, uh, divisional commander. But, yeah, he does not do well in his his only combat debut. Or No, he was he was in, he was, he was Cape Gloucester, too. Yeah, I was just going to say correct myself there. But anyway, pray continue. Yeah. Yeah. Dovali's a different kind of guy. He's he's a little more um, affable, number one. 
to yeah. he he's certainly more attuned to the situation as it stands. And you said artillery. He is a master of artillery. This guy yes. was in this guy yes. was in, he's he, he's got bloodlines and artillery all the way back damn near to World War One. So the dude knows what the hell he's talking about. However, for the attack on May the 3rd, he set two objective lines for his men because, you know, not going to be denied just because we attack once and are repulsed, we're going to come back at you. First line for the 1st Marine Regiment stretched along the railroad track from the bridge across the uh, bridge across the Asakawa River to the point opposite Miyagasuku, yep. and then from Ushi Ushima to Dakishi. Good God, these names. The 5th Marines were given the job of clearing out the gorges and hills in the area that became known as the Owacha Pocket. Bill, what happens on the next day when this attack sets off on May the 3rd? Well, at first it started looking a little better. Rain slackened and then stopped, allowing some movement along the Marine line for a renewed assault towards Awacha. Fire support proved excellent from heavy artillery. Now it was the Army's time to return the favor of inter-service artillery support. You'll remember last week we talked about the Marines providing artillery support to the Army in this case, it's going to be the 27th Division's Field Artillery Regiment that's going to be staying on the lines after the infantry had retrograded. And so the Army's artillery is providing support to the Marines. And last week, we mentioned that the Marines provided superb integrated joint Army support to the Army. And the same thing's going to happen here. In that sector, rendered yeoman service to the Marines, who had only weeks before done the same. So... The 5th Marines make some gains in the area, roughly five to 600 yards. This is how we're measuring gains these days, folks, where they were then met with furious artillery fire that kept some of the men firmly planted where they had stopped. Of course, this is Japanese artillery we're talking about now, and forced others to pull back from the ground, from ground they had just taken. So, Sterling Mace of I'm going to call it Kilo Company. I can't King. get out of my modern <laughs> parlance, right? My, my, uh, Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines said, we got up to the top of this little hill and held it for a while. Then Jesus, the artillery, they threw at us. My God, I had never experienced a barrage like that before. We sat there and took it for a long time. How long? I just don't know. And then we got the hell off that damned hill in a damned hurry. Mace was in for a long slog through the rest of Okinawa. What he experienced on May 3rd would repeat itself almost daily with a few breaks throughout the remainder of the month, Seth. Yeah, and just a reminder, Sterling Mace, like you said, he was in K-35. He was in Sledge's company, and uh, I knew uh, Mace for a long time. He was a good dude. He was a BA Armin uh, during mm. this operation, and uh, he later... We can talk about that later, but next week, uh, he he kind of, it gets to him. The battle starts to get to to Sterl, and uh, he kind of kind of lost it, frankly. Uh, uh, but we can get to that later. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and he had no problem admitting it either. He had no problem saying, I was out, I was done. Yeah. So um, back on April the 29th, now we got to talk about what is the final Japanese offensive against the Americans in World War II. Back on April the 29th, which was also Hirohito's birthday, uh, Japanese General Cho Isamu. We've talked about this guy a lot, and we're going to keep talking about him. And 32nd Army Commanding General Ushijima engaged in what I put in the notes, spirited conversation. Well, spirited and also fueled by alcohol, too. Yes. Uh, there was yes. a lot of drinking going on in this uh, con concave of a conclave of, of staff officers that was huddled up here. And yeah, you can start to see some of the divisions within 32nd Army are coming to the fore again. Mm -hmm. I, I put if in it was in a cave, uh, John, it would have been a conclave and a concave. So you had it right. <laughs> wow. There. <laughs> I appreciate that. Wow. Thank you for rescuing me. <laughs> sure. Wow. <laughs> After several minutes, and how many minutes, God knows, of Cho, as I put in the notes, ranting and raving about the need for another counteroffensive, Ushijima grew silent. Cho reportedly said, and I quote, and this comes out of, which by the way, this book, Yahara. The Battle for Okinawa by Colonel Hiromichi Yahara, uh, which I know, John, you're going to... Yeah, he's yeah. the staff planning officer. 
the operations officer, I should say, and he is going to be the senior survivor from this battle. And he goes on to write what is really a pretty interesting book on the battle. It is. It is. And this quote comes from that very book. Cho reportedly said, quote, we must mount a massive counterattack while we still have the strength. In a few more weeks, attrition will have eaten away at our forces and we will be too weak to mount an offensive. We must strike now and destroy the Americans, even at the risk of losing our whole army. Better we should die fighting than to keep slipping passively towards sure defeat, unquote. We've remarked on the idiocy of this gentleman before, <laughs> and I, it bears repeating now. Um, what you're playing for here from a strategic standpoint for the sake of the Japanese nation is time. Correct. And yes, slipping passively towards defeat is the object of the entire exercise. <laughs> it exactly. is to keep drawing this thing out as long as possible, you idiot Isamu Cho. But yeah. uh, he, go ahead. I consider him a strategic genius. May all of our enemies <laughs> absorb General Cho's wisdom. Yes, yes, please do. Please do. Mm. Read deeply of his memoirs, if there are any. Um, but he's not wrong in in what do I want to say? He is absolutely vocalizing what is the heart of this army. You know, this has always been the core ethos of the Japanese army has always been offensively minded, maneuver oriented warfare. It had worked great for them back in 42 and it's no longer working great. But yeah, Osamu has not been reading the memos. And, that, and that's what I put in the notes is that his fiery yet foolish words actually fell on receptive ears. Yep. And this goes back to what we were talking, what you just said, and what we were talking about last week as well, is that a lot of the junior officers, a lot of the JOs in this group of dudes are these fiery, you know, fire eating, you know, uh, offensive, just guys who yep. just want to fight. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you can actually get something done and not die foolishly, and that's right. exactly what's going to happen here, which is yeah. you know, just yeah. ridiculous. Yes, yeah, Seth, I, I want to pull on John's point just a minute, and it's because there's a lesson in this. For senior officers, you've got to modulate the aggressiveness and tenor of your junior officers who may not have strategic outlook. And in this case, John's right. The objective was to drag the war out and create as many casualties as possible to put Japan in a better negotiating position. And Joe Cho is running straight into the enemy and basically overriding the emperor in that right. regard and, and leadership in Tokyo Fine. in that yeah. regard. I don't care what the junior officers are saying right now. As the senior officer, the commanding general should have known enough to override his deputy. And that didn't happen. That did not happen. But you know, it, it, this it's not really surprising. And and like you put in the notes, Kurabayashi never would have put up with that because you know he yeah. kicked he kicked somebody to the curb that was very similar. However, this junior officer, this younger fiery officer, like basically ignoring senior officers' orders and or wishes or whatever plans, whatever you want to say, this is not new in the no, Japanese army. It's a time honored tradition. Yeah, yeah. Gekko Kujo, you know, leadership from below. Yeah, because this is the manifestation of of the same modulus where you've got these young junior officers who are assassinating prime ministers if they get overly uppity and won't vote for the right kind of budgets. And so, yeah, this kind of insubordinate, you know, let's call it what it is, you know, what, what we is, would call yeah. it in a Western army is insubordination is has been nurtured and uh, allowed to be given free reign for decades at this point. And here's a manifestation of it here right on this island. Here's what you get. So the only one of the only voices against this idea was the aforementioned Colonel Yahara, who is the guy who was the defensive mastermind of all of these defenses that we had run up to so far. He said he said that the plan that had been initiated by him under Ushijima's orders was working perfectly. It was yeah. doing exactly what it was designed to do, which was bleed the Americans white and buy or buy time with the lives unfortunately of japanese defenders it was doing what it was supposed to do right however his words as right as they were fell on deaf ears as opposed to cho and the offensive counteroffensive would indeed occur 
at this point, you would think that Ushijima would have stepped up and said, you know what, dude, shut up and get out. But it appears that but that he yeah. is just he's he's out of touch. He's like, I'm out. I'm done. Which is which is interesting, too, because when you read the army histories, uh, they are fairly complimentary of Ushijima. And I am not. I, mm. I don't think that. He's, he's, he's a weak commander. He's, he's weak. He's weak. Yeah, he is. He is good to his men. He's not one of these violent, you know, hitter kind of dudes who's, you know, constantly beating up his subordinates. He's courtly. He's gentlemanly. But no, he does not have the inner steel to, again, um, you know, put these guys into line like we saw with with Kurabayashi and and to the same extent with uh, Colonel Nakagawa and Peleliu, who, you know, you want to talk about fighting down to the last bloody dribble that garrison you know ends up with 99.8 percent of their combat soldiers dead as a result i mean good lord yeah. so yeah ushijima is just not that breed of cat and he caves to cho yes he does so the japanese 24th division is going to take the line now because the 62nd had been pretty much used up destroyed yeah, yeah. uh the four they, they, they would seize the according to cho's plan they would seize the eastern end of the maeda escarpment gaining control of highway five the 44th brigade would drive towards the west coast and cut off the first marine division the 44th brigade would then wipe out the hardened marine division while the 24th division regrouped and recaptured the maeda escarpment to the east Two regiments would hit the 7th ID near Conical Hill. Bill, you have a map, and I know, John, you want to go through this thing. Pop that bad yeah, boy I'll, up I'll just do an intro and then let John uh, just wax poetic. So here's the Maida Escarpment. That Highway 5 you spoke of, Seth, runs roughly up like this. Yep. Conical Hill is way down here to the east. Remember the Marines? Uh, yeah, the Marines are to the west. The Army appears to the east. And so Conical Hill's pretty deep, uh, you know, in Japanese, what is still Japanese territory at this point. So go ahead, John. Oh, this is, yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful map. Um, it's a ludicrous plan. There's no slightest possibility that this is going to be successful. Among other things, you know, the two army divisions that are on this end of the line at this point, 7th and 77th, these are two of the finest divisions in the Pacific. And there is absolutely, absolutely no way that a single regiment of attackers is going to be attacking a division at one to three odds and wipe them out. That's just nonsense. And the, the same is roughly true of, you know, the Marine end of the line as well. The other thing to point out here is that there's going to be a series of amphibious assaults that the Japanese yes. are going to carry out using barges and in some cases canoes that are supposed to do these hooks behind the American lines and, you know, sweep in behind them. Again, this is a vestige of stuff that had worked very well for them in places like Malaya during the 1942 campaign there, these amphibious hooks that would discomfit allied defensive lines. But we are an entirely different animal. And this entire island at this point is under 24-hour surveillance. We have total air supremacy here, total naval supremacy as well. You know, again, I don't I don't know what Isamu was smoking when he came up with this plan, but it's just this is this is a, a school child diagram. You know, a fifth grader could have come up with a more competent plan of attack than this. It's just it's a pipe dream. So to that point, Cho himself, according uh, according to what Yahara put in there, felt that once the ground was gained, optimistically speaking, if the ground was gained, once the ground was gained, even if it couldn't be held, the Japanese army on Okinawa would have died with honor. That's what it's all about. It's all about dying with honor. And I put in the notes, in my opinion, with that statement, he knows full well this is going to fail. He has to. Mm -hmm. And like you said, and we talked about it before we started recording, these dudes, uh, we, we've got dudes in the air 24-7. we got night fighters and marine night fighters that are based at Yontan, flying Corsairs at night, doing all this observation, nocturnal yep. observation. You know, we're obviously, we got airplanes up in the day all the time. You know, Piper Cubs, from, from Piper Cubs to what have you. Lots, and of, I mean, lots of fighters doing, doing yeah. tactical missions over this thing. I mean, we've talked a lot about American artillery, but there's constant tactical air support in, in this uh, battle going on as well. And yeah, the island is completely ringed by our naval vessels. We've got destroyers and cruisers roaming around offshore that are 
putting in fire missions as well as as part of the support for 10th Army. So, you know, the notion that that some canoe-led amphibious hook is going to somehow get past the gauntlet that that rings this island is just is just ludicrous. Yeah, it's foolishness. So, so the 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 artillery is the harbinger of the attack. The Japanese do fire a tremendous fire. amount of artillery. And we'll get to the numbers on that in just a minute. But before the main assault actually occurs, the ill-fated Japanese amphibious assault took place. Bill, tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm going to bring the map up again, Seth. And it's just as, because this is as silly as it sounds. Here they are, supposed to go in with, you know, basically, um, you know, whatever landing craft they have. And as John mentioned, local and indigenous canoes yeah and this is the 26th engineer shipping regiment and assorted infantry behind the marine lines in order to execute a double envelopment that's the plan so you're going to go here you're going to go here you're going to go here and try to do this double envelopment right and i'm sorry when when you hear when you hear a, a unit designation of 26 engineer shipping regiment that does not exactly fill one with with the notion that these are amphibious warfare specialists you know mm-hmm. these yeah. these are barge drivers for crying out loud anyway exactly yeah exactly but at this point they're using whoever they have at yeah. hand <laughs> i mean they've lost so many people that they're right. using whatever's available right it's a uh, you've heard a vessel of opportunity, big naval uh, statement. These are troops of opportunity. The amphibious yeah. landing was arguably the biggest mistake, the entire massive mistake. There was virtually no way that the Americans would not discover the slow moving Japanese barges, putt, 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 putt yeah. along the Okinawa coast during daylight or night hours. American aircraft, as you said, said, and John. Prowl the skies 24 hours a day looking for kamikazes. Right. Suicidal boat attacks. Remember, there were suicide surface craft here and stupid moves just like this one. So this is not going to go well. Yeah. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. So no surprise here. Once this Japanese amphibious assault does actually kick off, if you will, uh, Navy patrols on both coasts interdicted the first flanking attacks conducted by these raiders in these slow-moving barges near Kusan on the west coast, 1-1, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, and the LVTAs of the 3rd Armored Amphibian Battalion greeted the invaders, trying to come ashore with an absolutely deadly fuselage. No surprise here. You're landing in these slow-moving barges against the 1st Battalion of the 1st Marines. These guys, these are not some hacks. These are not pogues. This is the real deal. They killed over 700 of these Japanese as they tried to force this amphibious landing. Further along the coast, 2-1 intercepted and killed 75 more, while the 1st Reconnaissance Company and the War Dog Platoon tracked down the last 65 hiding in the brush and killed them to a man. So... Hmm. So When I first read about this, the way I was visualizing it was completely wrong, I'm sure. But I was seeing those LVTAs going out to sea and having like a Civil War monitor battle over here on the east side of Okinawa. (laughs) What happened? What actually happened? They were just they were stationed along the beach line. They were not there for any other reason. But that's just that was their vehicle park. And the Japanese happened to land in a really bad spot. That's yeah, that's a bad look. Yeah, they landed. I mean, they literally landed at probably the worst spot that they could have potentially. Yeah, yeah, I I can't help but have some pathos here for, you know, those attacking troops because that's just. No, they didn't. All they're doing is what they're told. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's a few of them that are going, yay, you know, you know, we're going to do this, but. hmm. God, what a miserable, miserable way to die. Useless, stupid way to die. Anyway. Useless is exactly what it is. At 0430 on the 4th of May, the main offensive actually began with a tremendous Japanese artillery barrage. And I'm not making light of this. This is dead straight up. Yeah. Over the next 30 minutes, nearly 8,000 rounds of Japanese already fell on the 7th Infantry Division's lines alone, while another 4,000 fell on the lines of the 77th to the 7th Division's right. I mean, that's a lot of artillery a lot of fire. Yeah. Big time. Big time. 
On the 7th and 77th front, which is a lot of sevens, the GIs heard tanks in the distance before any artillery fell, and assuming that an attack was in the offing, prepared for just that type of an event. The 24th Division's attack against the GIs near the Maeda Escarpment was absolutely annihilated. Uh, the tank support the 24th Division was supposed, Japanese now I'm talking about, was supposed to receive, actually never materialized in any major form, and what tanks did move forward were picked off by U.S. artillery as they moved down the roads. It's almost like, you know, uh, it, it, it doing the same thing to the Japanese that they were doing to us as we were moving armor into these very same positions, but from the opposite direction. Many Japanese units in the 77th ID sector found themselves isolated, no surprise here, and after having passed through American lines unnoticed initially, these units then became cut off and were killed to a man. One by one as the day went on, Japanese losses in the 77th sector were enormous, well over 700 dead in a matter of hours, guys. Okay, so I'm just doing some real-time history here because I, I suddenly I, I wanted to call up some comparative numbers from 1942 for you. So I'm going off shoot. script. But um, shoot. yeah, shoot, because literally that's what I wanted to talk about. So this artillery bombardment by the Japanese dumps a grand total of 12,000 shells in the course of Ish. half an hour. Just, And that's a big shoot by Japanese standards. That's a lot of boom, boom. Mm -hmm. Battle uh, Operation Lightfoot, the beginning bombardment of the, uh, the Battle of El Alamein, the second battle that Montgomery leads. That first bombardment, now granted, Montgomery has an artillery park that is roughly five times larger than what Ushijima's got. He's got 908 barrels on the line. But in the first evening, the British dump 276,000 shells on the Germans. So that just gives oh, you a... Almighty... OK, and that's that's not even a big shoot by late war allied mm -hmm. standards. I mean, the beginning of the battle of the uh, the Ruhr pocket at the end of the war, I believe the preliminary bombardment for that was two hundred and seventy nine thousand shells or something. So, mm -hmm. you know, not to belittle the Japanese, but, you know, the scale of artillery support is just in a completely different league at this point for the Allies versus the Axis. And I'm sure that if we were to look into the ammunition consumption the 10th Army is going through, um, oh. it's just absolutely night and day. But of course, to the Marines that are sitting out in this, you know, absolutely barren wilderness at this point under the you know, receiving end of those 12,000 shells, this is a very, very unpleasant and unprecedented experience. And, and when compared to other... Japanese artillery barrages in the Pacific War. Yep. This is big. This is big. This, this is yeah, big. When you, and, when you think of big Japanese artillery shoots, the two that come to mind are the month-long siege of Corregidor, and I've got the shell shoot there. That was about 100,000 rounds, I believe, over the course a of a month. month. Thank you. And then the pre-invasion bombardment of Singapore Island right before uh, that bastion falls in February. And I think that was about 20,000 shells. So mm -hmm. these these figures and more will be yours in my 1942 monstrosity. <laughs> anyway, Bill, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to make a snarky comment about the European theater and this but okay. then, who's this <laughs> Montgomery guy? But anyway, right. I, we'll, we'll skip that. We'll skip that. That's fair. Yeah. So anyway, back to the scrum. Back at, to the scrum. At dawn, First Lieutenant Richard McCracken, commanding Company A, 184th Infantry Regiment, observed 2,000 Japanese soldiers. And obviously, you know, this is a rough estimate, but still, it's a lot of dudes in the open area east and north of Kakazu. They were perfect, as he said, artillery meat which is you know, a good way to put it. Unable to get through to his artillery support, McCracken called his battalion commander, Colonel, a, a guy named Colonel Mayberry, and described the lucrative targets. Mayberry was equally pleased, I would imagine. So McCracken suggested, however, that the colonel should not be too happy. A group of Japanese that moment, at that moment, was only 100 yards away from Mayberry's observation post. This conversation is actually relatively humorous. It goes, oh, no, Mayberry said, that's a patrol from K Company down there. 
<laughs> I don't know who the hell it is, but there's a lot of them, and they've got two field pieces that are pointed right at your OP, McCracken replied. <laughs> Indeed, there was there was a party of Japanese who were busily setting up 275 millimeters just below Maybury, but C Company 17th IR had spotted this activity and within a few minutes maneuvered tanks into position to wipe these guys out. Bill, the 3rd Battalion of the 184th, they also come under attack by a large number of Japanese in this assault, don't they? They do. You know, recovering from this loss, this temporary loss of situational awareness, 3rd Battalion, 184th, you know, fights off an attack by 200 Japanese who thereupon withdraw to the ruins of Unaha and set up mortars. And so a mortar duel ensues. These guys are within close range, right? sometimes at ranges of 250 yards. 3rd Battalion, 32nd Infantry Regiment also poured fire on the enemy there. After the impetus of the attack was lost, a Japanese officer stood out in open ground and waved his katana to assemble his men for an attack. And an American mortarman waited for a worthwhile target to develop. He wanted more than just this one soldier, officer with his sword then put mortar fire on it. Four times the officer assembled a group only to have his men killed or scattered before he was finally killed. Just, you know, John, you put in the notes one more brilliant tactical example of leadership. This is, this is very sad at this point. It is. It is. These deaths are happening for no good, good reason. reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jeez, Louise. And it ain't done. So by nope. 0800, the Japanese had been driven beyond grenade range on the entire 77th, not 77th, 7th Division's front. But they did not abandon their attack, perhaps because they had been ordered to advance, quote, until the last man, unquote. They made the mistake of milling about in the exposed flatland where they became perfect targets. They neither pressed the attack nor essayed an organized withdrawal. They just kind of stood there. American, no, no surprise here. American heavy weapons just pour it in there. And one of the veterans of a platoon sergeant said, we laid them down like ducks, unquote. You got to you gotta kind of wonder if these dudes just were like, you know what, I'm out. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Just kill me. Bring now. it home. Yeah. Right. I, kill me yeah. I, I have no explanation for this. Um, yikes. Yeah, and and as, as horrible as it is to, to say, I mean, they would have done better dying in a hole someplace and expending their lives at least to some semi-worthwhile end in, in terms of slowing us down. But this is just, just meaningless slaughter. The only thing I could think of, maybe, and I have no proof of this either way, is maybe some of these are Okinawan conscripts who just don't know any better. But I mean, even yeah, then, they may would, not know I'd what like to, to think. Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible too. That you know, you know, one of the dynamics that we see during the uh, the Iwo Jima campaign is that by the end of that campaign, because of all the local counterattacks and that kind of stuff, you really start to mow through your officer corps at a disproportionate sure. rate. And so, if you've got not enough officers in charge of these new uh, Okinawan conscripts that just may not know what to do, then yeah, they just kind of mill about out there without any leadership and just get absolutely stonked on. Yeah, and that I, I, I mean, that's, obviously, we have no way to prove this, but that's, yeah, that's, that's a reasonable that's assumption. A, yeah, it's the most credible explanation I've heard so far. So, yeah. yikes. So the Japanese offensive, such as it was, uh, continued the following day with no real gains made and only lives lost. Uh, by the end of May the 5th, the last Japanese offensive against the Americans in World War II was over. I'm going to say that again. The last Japanese offensive against the Americans in World War II was over. Ushijima, by not ignoring Cho's urgings, had wasted the lives of somewhere between five and 6,000 of his men, and this is, I was, you were 100% right, and more than 50 pieces of his artillery, John. Yeah, which is about a quarter of their entire artillery park at the beginning of the battle and has already obviously been whittled down uh, throughout the course of, of the combat during May. So I don't know what their artillery count is at this point, but they're probably edging down to only half of their guns are left or maybe even fewer than that. Hard to know. Yeah. 
the the yeah, offensive. Says, oh, go ahead, Bill. Um, even though this is the last offensive, you know, it doesn't mean that dying's over. To quote oh, my God. friend David Ayer in the movie Fury, this war is going to end soon, but before it does, a lot more people are going to die. Yeah, a lot of them are going to be Americans. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, you know, like I said, the offensive gained absolutely nothing. And I put this in the notes, and I wanted to point it out because it reminds me of. Um, I can't think of the guy's name on Saipan. I just lost a uh, Japanese Saito. General. Thank you. It reminds me of Saito because Cho, the guy who hatched this idiocy, sat in his cave and watched yeah. it all unfold. Didn't take part right. in it at all. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Um, and so there's this beautiful little vignette here uh, at the end of this offensive where Ushijima now summons yahara to his command post in in this sequence of caves underneath uh shuri castle and and tells yahara that as predicted the offensive has been a total failure and that yahara's judgment was correct and ushijima at this point says uh you know he's still determined to fight on to the southernmost hill to the last square inch of land and to the last man and from now on ushijima says I leave everything up to you. My instructions are to do whatever you feel is necessary. And Yahara writes then after the war, what an outrageous thing for Ushijima to say. Now that our forces were exhausted, he finally recognized what I had been advocating from the start. It was now too late to accomplish anything. I was not only frustrated, I was furious. And the denouement to this is that Cho is in the next you know, office over the next cave or what have you. And he could not have helped but hear this exchange between Ushijima and Yahara. And from this point onward, he will start joking with Yahara. Hey, Yahara, when will it be okay for me to commit Harakiri? Is, is today a good day? So, you know, you want to talk about a dysfunctional uh, leadership within your army at this point yeah yahara i think has every right to be uh as frustrated as he can be absolutely yeah i only hope that yahara responded with yeah today's a good day <laughs> today's um, a great day yeah. right over there would be work would work for go, me great yeah please do go right ahead yeah yeah knock yourself out literally yeah so on may the 8th the sixth marine sixth marine division filtered into the front line alongside first marine division the 6th would assume responsibility for the westernmost sector of the island, while the battered 96th, now filled with replacements who had moved in to take over uh, from the, the 96th, moved back up to the front line to take over for the 7th, who had been on the front lines for 39 consecutive days. That's a long friggin' time. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. That is a long damn time. After realigning his divisions, Buckner was content to hold off on another immediate assault. And kind of understand why at this point. By now, he had realized that in order to get the Japanese out of Okinawa, each and every man would have to be dug out of every hole in the island. He, I put in the notes, he was in no rush, but his bosses were. Yeah. Because segue at this point, we haven't talked about this. We're going to, obviously. Sure. But, you know, the, the Navy is being just absolutely pounded on by yes. the kamikazes at this point. And so Spruance wants to get this operation over with absolutely as quickly as possible. And so does Nimitz. So I, I wouldn't say that there's a sense of lethargy that's infecting Buckner at this point. But he is certainly taking a very deliberate approach to the battle plan. And again, this... You know, was there an opportunity here to potentially maneuver your way out of this problem? You still could have done an amphibious operation, sure. although I believe by this point, 2nd Marine Division has been pulled out and sent back to Saipan. Is that right? Correct. They're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Or they're at least at the very least they're on their way. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that opportunity may actually have literally sailed at this point. Correct. So, yeah, I don't know. But again, yeah. not the most before... inspired leadership. Mm -hmm. No, 2020 hindsight, that, sound, that feels True. like a strategic mistake. But remember, we didn't think this was going to be the last operation. Also true. So, Very true. Point. Yep. Very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Kelly Turner at one point told Buckner that he had to, quote, keep pushing. John's favorite. Keep pushing it. now. 
and yeah. and and again, you know, you can we can fault Kelly Turner for being a tool as often as we want, but he was right. He's he right. Was right. You know, he's right at here, this yeah. point, yeah, he's not wrong. Yeah, he's not Maybe wrong. We're going to talk about away. Get this thing over with, so we can. Yeah, get yeah. get the hell out of here. You know, because as long as long as they're conducting operations, the fleet's got to hang around. We're tethered to this island, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And mo- the thing that has made our carrier fleet such a lethal implement is its strategic mobility and the fact that it can show up, do its thing, and then run away. And we right. can't do that right now. Mm-mm. So, Mm-mm. no. And I mean, the the law, and I, like you said, you know, we're going to talk about the 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 naval issues, shall we say, off of Okinawa in depth. But the losses are just staggering yeah, for really the United hurting. States Navy, big time. Yeah, this, and it's all from Gamkazis. Well, most yeah, of it. And this this is the, the most serious fight that we're going to be in the Pacific naval wise uh, during the entire war. I mean, this is the mm-hmm. first time when our casualties have started really ratcheting up to the, the level that we had seen off of Guadalcanal, which was, you know, almost 5,000 sailors killed. We're, we're already starting to bump up against that. Uh, here at Okinawa. It's bad. Yep, mm-hmm. indeed it is. So Buckner responded to Tur- Kelly Turner's uh, desires, if you will, by ordering another all-out assault on the Japanese lines on May the 11th. At 07 on the same, on May 11th, all four divisions would jump off at the exact same time. The two army divisions would push towards Conical Hill and Chocolate Drop and uh, advanced towards Shuri Castle, some 3,500 yards distant. The Marines of the Old Breed would move towards Shuri by going up and over Dakishi Ridge and then move through the area known as Wana, with Wana Ridge and Wana Draw among the land features. Pock, <laughs> I found this to be interesting. Pock marked with coral caves and assumed to be infested with fight-to-the-death defenders, obviously. The Wana area in particular would prove to be, shall we say, difficult the Marines, the 1st Marine Division in particular, was chosen for this area by Buckner because of the caves. He assumed, and I guess rightfully so, that the old breed had experienced fighting cave defenses on Peleliu, and they certainly did. And that is specifically why these poor SOBs were put in this area. And we're going to talk about Wana here later on in the episode because it gets overshadowed by what the 6th Marine Division does yeah. at the same time. But yeah, it's... Uh, no. Which got for us, Bill, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna put in a, a snarky quip. Go, go yeah, for it. It's right here. The Wana area, the ridge is right here, and then again, Conical Hill to, re, to remind everybody is down here. Yep. So this battlefield spreads across the entire width of the island. Yep. I was gonna say that if you really wanted experts in caves, who you should have gone to is 81st Infantry Division because they were the ones that, you know arguably knocked out uh, as many or more of those caves than first Mardiv did on, on Peleliu, but yeah, whatever. They ain't here. Mm-hmm. So they ain't here. So the six Marine division that had, as we said earlier, just days before taken up positions on the line were to move down the West coast to sever the Japanese line attack across the Asakawa river, and then turn East bypassing Naha and, com- and complete an encirclement of Ushijima's forces around Shuri. This is ambitious, to say the least. I was For just going to say, I mean, thinking that your army divisions are going to advance 3,500 yards in the course of yeah. this, well, that's rather ambitious, given the way the fighting has gone for the last month plus. If you're, if a good day is 500 yards, yards or two yeah. or 300 yards, 3,500 yards is a pipe dream. Yeah. That and we know some... what kind of pipe. So, yeah. I mean, just... <laughs> Must anyway. be some eye test stuff right there. I just say that. Yeah. Goodness. The, for the 6th Marine Division, in particular, their line of advance seemed to be free of any real natural obstructions. The only obstruction in, obstructions in their path were these three little hills, none more than 50 feet high. Yeah, hmm, little bitty little turds on there on the map. The three hills didn't even have names on American maps. Maps they were so nondescript. However, by the end of the fight for these three hills, their names would enter Marine legend. They of course are Half Moon, Horseshoe, and Sugarloaf Hill. 
good. So just to oh just to give a, a sense to our our viewers of when we say diminutive, we mean diminutive. So uh, let me see if I can share my screen here. Do it. And here is a picture taken shortly after the Battle of Sugarloaf Hill itself, and you can see there's some sort of a tractor or something here in front of it, and that may be foreshortened. It's actually closer to the viewer than it is to the hill. But of interest, if you look up here right on the top of the hill, you can see two dudes standing on the top of that hill. And indeed, you know, the trees that are still blasted are much taller than those two gentlemen that are sitting right here. Um, again, in terms of, of scale, here is a picture of what Sugarloaf looks like now. It is basically a city block long, and it's got a water tower sitting on the top of it. Uh, it's a it's a parking lot for a church. So this is not a big terrain feature at all. It's it's the size of a of a fly spec. It's just nothing. And you know, and we were remarking before we started recording this is that as big as Okinawa is, a lot of these battlefields i mean the whole island is a battlefield let's be real but a lot of the places that we're talking about that that everybody knows and associates with okinawa like kakazu ridge and hacksaw ridge and this they're tiny man i mean yeah. they're like they're well i mean hack, hacksaw hacksaw is a good solid mile long i mean it's it's but it's a pretty, area there yeah the actual you know combat area that you know like 77th was involved in is is smaller but as a terrain feature itself, it is it's it's not insignificant, but yeah, you you scale that against Sugarloaf, which you can walk the entire length of Sugarloaf Hill in three minutes. You're you know how long does it take you to walk a block? That's it. And uh, yeah, we're going to be stuck here for days and days and days and days and days. Bill, tell us how this adventure, shall we say, kicks off with the sixth division. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the map real quick. First is the Asa River that we just spoke about. Notice yep. Sugarloaf is down here. It's very close to Naha. Okay, so that's kind of the set sets the stage for what's happening. So yeah. Sixth Division kicks off their part of the offensive by approaching Asakawa River. I just showed you that. Wading across the chest deep river, the Marines safely make it across the other side. Once they emerge on the other side of the river, the Japanese open fire. K Company, 3rd Battalion, 22nd, was caught in a crossfire as they tried to make it to the area on the other side, uh, on the other bank. A small promontory to the right. For two hours, K322 and two other companies were marooned on the enemy side of the river until Divisional Commander General Lemuel Shepard had a pontoon bridge built across the river and brought two battalions of Shermans across as well as the rem remainder of 322. By the end of, of May 11th, the 6th Division had moved 1,000 yards out and were cleaning out pockets of yeah. 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 They, they had earlier, that they had bypassed earlier in the day. By late afternoon on the 13th, the division, specifically the 22nd Marines, uh, Marine Regiment, had advanced a further 2,000 yards but it suffered nearly 800 casualties since the 11th. The 22nd Marines advanced down the area and came to the corridor of land that held to Shuri Heights, back to the map. Shuri yep. Heights are to the east here. With so Shuri what we're Castle attempting to do really is sort of a hook around behind Shuri. Um, we're getting sick of beating our heads against the defenses right in front of Shuri Castle. And so the notion is if we can hook around behind it, that we'll be able to isolate it and capture it from the rear if need be. This is the first, I got to point this out. This is the first instance of any type of movement yeah. that Buckner has actually instigated in this, entire, in this entire campaign. Everything else has been just smash mouth footballs for running straight at the defensive line. Now he's going to try and end around. And it, you know, it only well, took him a month to do that. Well, yeah, but some of this is also driven by the fact that in the wake of that disastrous counterattack, sure. um, sure. you know, 62nd Division uh, now is is even more shelled out than they had been. And so the, sure. the Japanese are weakening in this in this sector, at least temporarily, until we run into this little trio of terrain features. True. That is yeah. very true. So sure. by the morning of May the 12th, 1945, 
10th Army, United States 10th Army casualty figure set at roughly 18,000 men so far for the Okinawa campaign. The previous week, May 5th through 12th, threw an additional 4,500 American casualties to that already staggering total. Japanese had their backs to the wall, like you were just saying, John. And as we all know, they weren't going to give an inch until they were dead. Uh, that would They would make the Americans pay dearly for every single hill, every ridge, and every single inch of ground. Buckner, already under pressure from above to get things moving, kept pushing his divisions, which, of course, would add to those casualties. 18,000 casualties by uh, May the 12th. Yeah. That's just on, on, on land, by the way. Right. I'm just going to clarify that. Yeah. Good yeah, gracious. Real-time history here, I think um, – we're, we're approaching the Iwo Jima numbers, aren't we? At 20,000 casualties plus 7,000. Yeah, 26,000. Yeah, 26,000 on Iwo. 26,000, yeah. Yeah, so we're getting there. We're getting there. So on the morning of May the 12th, G Company, 2nd Battalion, 22nd Marines were assigned to lead off the day's assault on the little hill in front of them, which, of course, is Sugarloaf Hill. As Captain Owen Stebbins's company looked at their objective some 900 yards away, it didn't look that foreboding. By the picture you just showed us, Stebbins and his men were confident. How bad could it possibly be? While the defensive complex, as I put in the notes, was no Mount Suribachi in terms of height or territorial observation, it was absolutely honeycombed with enemy positions. Any one of the three hills, which of course is Horseshoe, Half Moon, and Sugarloaf, could be defended by any of the others. Interlocking fields of fire from each hill protected the slopes and approaches to the other hills. Pre-registered artillery spots had been gridded all over Sugarloaf's terrain, allowing any Marine that moved forward to come under withering artillery fire. Machine gun positions that the Marines had never seen before lined Half Moon and Horseshoe, while the real beast, which of course is Sugarloaf, is pockmarked with concrete reverse slope positions that would have to be eliminated one by one by hand by hand. Inside these posi those positions were defenders that numbered just shy under an entire regiment of Japanese, all interconnected by tunnels to reinforce any position that would potentially come under attack. Yeah. It's a beast. And, and meanwhile, off to your left, as you're looking at it from the Marines' vantage point, you've got Shuri over to the left, literally enfilading you. And so... Any of the artillery pieces that are up in the Shuri complex likewise can support uh, an assault or help beat off an assault that the Americans try to drive in on this thing. Yeah, everything is interconnected and everything helps defend everything else. So it's yeah. not you're not just attacking one hill, you're attacking all three. Yeah, it's like a little Even if you are lateral triangle of death is kind of what it comes down to. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Stebbins, the men, man we mentioned just a minute ago, led his men from the front. No surprise here. And the first several hundred yards of the first assault on Sugarloaf couldn't have gone any better. Casualties were minimal and enemy fire was light. A few rifle shots here and there. And that was about it. Obviously, the Japanese are waiting for their opportunity. As they started up the, the higher slopes, the uh, fire grew in its pitch suddenly. Behind Stebbins were Shermans of the 6th Tank Battalion. As Stebbins and his Marines began to take heavier fire, concealed 47mm anti-tank guns opened up and knocked out the tanks one by one, leaving Stebbins and his men fully exposed. Japanese were just waiting for us to come up these friggin' nails. Absolutely. Man. Yeah. So, as... Go ahead. No, gonna say, I was going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're waiting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as Stebbins' Marines continued to move up Sugarloaf Slopes, a rain, absolute rain of artillery and machine gun fire met the Marines, pinning down two of the three platoons in Stebbins' company. He realized his, his position and assumed that reaching the top of the hill would help to eliminate the positions firing on him and his men. Stebbins, this guy's got balls of solid steel, rallied, rallied 40 of his men nearby, including a gentleman named Lieutenant Dale Bear, and raced up the slopes into the teeth of withering Japanese fire. Halfway up the hill, Stebbins was riddled with machine gun fire through his legs, collapsing to the ground, surrounded by 28 of his wounded Marines, and that he starts off with 40, 41 if you count himself, and now he's got 28 guys wounded surrounding him. He orders this gentleman, Lieutenant Bear, to assume command, that's his XO, 
and finished the assault with what men he had left. Before Bear could acknowledge his orders, Bear's arm was shredded by machine gun fire. In a semi-conscious state, Bear was pulled back down the slopes of the hill. As he comes to, he saw what was left of his company under tremendous fire, his men dropping like flies. This is the first assault against this bad boy. Bill, take us through what Bear does after this. Yeah, so again, going to the map, here's Sugarloaf, here's Horseshoe, and Half Moon's over to the east. Yep. Shuri is to the far east, but it's within artillery fire and filleted, as John said. And this is where these guys are trying to assault, okay? So despite the intense pain in his shredded arm, Bear says, I got to do something. So he gets off the stretcher, grabs a weapon, heads back up the hill with the two of his Marines. As he goes up the hill, he begins firing at suspected Japanese position to give his Marines cover. The closer he got to his company, the heavier the fire. Hit again by enemy fire, Bear reached a position in which there was a submachine gun. So he grabs the weapon with his one good hand and he races up the hill, the remaining 20 or so Marines following close behind. Bear and his Marines reached the top of the hill, yay, but took tremendous fire with total disregard for his own safety. Bear stood on the crest of the hill alone and fired the machine gun with his one good hand. How do you this is fire like a bar with one hand? I don't even, I didn't even think that's physically he, possible. So, uh, I, yeah. uh, who knows ahead. what you could do with adrenaline, right? I um, guess, yeah. Good Lord. Someone, yeah. So, BAR, so BAR is about 24 pounds. It's about 24 pounds of steel. Do we know that it's mm. a bar, or did he no. grab maybe a Thompson or something like that? No, we do not know. It's, do it's not an know. auto... Yeah, it's an automatic, automatic weapon. Okay. It's an automatic weapon. So it could be a Tommy or it could be a BAR. Either one. Thompson, you can definitely want in. That that is there's no yeah. question about that. I, but a BAR it, I think it's possible, but in in the state that he is in, it would be difficult. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway. Even the, even the Thompson is not going to be accurate. It's going to you know no. right. the kickback's going to just going to draw you off. But anyway, mm -hmm. So he's so it was one good hand. He's shooting this machine gun. His men are retreating down the hill with with a smoke screen until Bear is hit repeatedly by enemy fire. Because of Bear's actions, the Marines begin to crawl begin to crawl down Sugarloaf's slopes, dragging their wounded, including Stebbins and Bear. So Bear would be awarded the Navy Cross. Is this posthumous, Seth? No, no, he no. lives. He survives. He lives. Yeah, yeah, he, he lives. Right. Which it, and Stevens, I believe Stevens got the Silver Star. Uh, he also lives, but yeah, it's just that's it's just it's just the first assault. Yeah, this is the opener. Yeah. Mm. So Company G charged up Sugarloaf three more times that day, only to be chased off by deadly Japanese fire every single time. By nightfall on May the twelfth, Company G was down to only seventy-five men after having started the day with 215. Attacks against Sugarloaf continued the following day, with Marines from the 22nd Regiment reaching its summit three times, only to be driven off all three times, sustaining heavy casualties from artillery behind Half Moon and Horseshoe, as well as machine gun fire from Horseshoe and Sugarloaf each time they attacked. Again, just because you're attacking one hill, does it, you're attacking all three, and they're all three fighting at the exact same time. So as we kind of alluded to in the beginning, American intelligence on this specific area was severely lacking, which is why it, I put in the notes, one must assume why individual companies were sent to attack Sugarloaf with little support for two days. This goes on. American guesstimates on enemy strength were vague, and initially it was assumed that each of the three hills were held by only a company of Japanese in actuality, about 2,000 Japanese and Okinawan conscripts held these little hills. Most of these guys were from the 15th Regiment of the 44th Brigade. Ignorance of this fact is probably what led to the first two days' worth of slaughter at Sugarloaf. I mean, that's the only thing I could yeah. possibly come up with. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, this is this is a, an objective that deserves a divisional scale attack, multiple Absolutely. regiments. Yeah, Absolutely. So. Absolutely. You're not going to get done with companies. No, not at all. 
You're just going to get companies wiped out, which is essentially what you do for two days. Finally, on May 14th, General Lemuel Shepard planned for an attack on all three hills simultaneously with Thank artillery, you. air, yeah, really, with artillery, air, and naval gunfire support. 22nd Marine, 2nd Battalion, CO Lieutenant Colonel Woodhouse was ordered to draw up the plan for their, of an attack and laid out the detail to his subordinates. The attack would be straightforward, up the slopes, take the hills, all of them right now. Typical, no, not degrading the marine corps but typical marine corps tactics c <laughs> c defense run at defense take defense. defense and move past defense right good gracious so assistant division commander brigadier general william clement sixth marine division uh, william clement handed woodhouse a handwritten order that said quote you are to attack immediately and continue the attack at all costs repeat all costs unquote as clement left Woodhouse turned to his XO and said, quote, this crap sounds like something out of World War I, unquote. And he's not far off. Right. He's really yeah. not. Without without the trenches. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tr trenches provided some level of protection, right? So some. It's not happening. Yeah. So, Bill, tell us about the attack. So, 1400, that afternoon, aided by artillery, the Marines making the attack were shorthanded. Yeah shorthanded, like a, a regiment shorthanded. Woodhouse's second battalion had been taking a beating in the days previous and were already severely under strength. By 1420, 20 minutes later, the attackers made their way up to the top of Horseshoe. This sound familiar? Different verse, same as the first, but were pinned down by Japanese fire. A handful of members of Lieutenant Robert Hitching's platoon made it to Half Moon's summit before being forced to withdraw. The situation at Sugarloaf was no different, the Marines having withdrawn yet again. At 1630, it's two hours later, Woodhouse receives orders to attack yet again. Covered by smoke and supported by four tanks, the infantry moved forward after a three-hour artillery barrage. Fox and George companies moved up, and after two hours of vicious fighting, reached Sugarloaf's summit, Again, again, of the 150 men who started the assault, only four officers and 40 enlisted men's men were left. Three of the four tanks had been knocked out. Most of the Marines pulled back again, except for one depleted squad. But this wasn't just any old squad, was it, Seth? No, this guy is just a freaking machine, man. So the day before the main assault, this guy's unbelievable. Major Henry Courtney, and that's not who I'm talking about, had yeah. ordered Corporal James Day to take his squad on a recon mission to link up with the 29th Marines. Now, Day is with the 22nd Marines. Uh, Day had made the trip up Sugarloaf's Hill twice, Sugarloaf's Slopes twice already in days previous. He was familiar with the terrain, having gone up there and retreated every single time. Upon reaching the 29th Marines, Courtney ordered Day's squad to accompany 29th, the 29th Fox Company in their assault the next morning to provide terrain guidance. As I said, he knew the ground. He'd been right. up there multiple times. Fox Company's assault failed, and they sustained heavy casualties. No surprise. Day's squad was down to seven men after Fox Company's failed assault, and by evening, Day was cut off with his men in a shell hole on the opposite shoulder of the hill. During the night... Corporal Day and his Marines could hear an assault taking place on the opposite side of the hill. Now, I don't have any proof of this, but I'm pretty damn sure this is Major Henry Courtney's assault on the opposite side of Sugarloaf Hill, which, of course, results in Courtney getting the Medal of Honor. During the assault, Day and his Marines opened fire on the Japanese from their position, diverting some of the Japanese away from the main Marine assault. And I'm, again, I'm pretty sure this is Henry Courtney doing his thing. The small depleted squad beat back three Japanese night assaults on their position with grenades, bayonets and bare fists five of day's men were wounded in the japanese assaults and fearing that they would die without medical attention this dude brought each one down the hill by himself to the aid station behind the lines when the corporal reached his position on the slope of the hill again his squad was only down to himself and two other marines three guys three people and, and homie ain't leaving. He's staying up there. Yeah. The next morning, 
May 15th, the three Marines watched another Marine assault form up and attack. Day and his Marines opened fire on the two columns of Japanese infantry who were making their way to attack the advanced Marine guard. Day and his Marines uh, attack broke up the small Japanese column but failed to stop the ultimate Japanese counterattack that pushed the Marines off the hill yet again. Yet again. Realizing that his position was in desperate need of an automatic weapon, the fearless, and I mean this guy, and I put that, he is fearless corporal, ran out of his hole and grabbed a discarded, one would imagine, from a dead Marine 1919A4 machine gun. As he gave the weapon to one of his two, one of the two Marines in his hole, a Japanese mortar round exploded on the edge of the hole, killing one of these guys and destroying the weapon that he just ran out in the no man's land to go get. This left only Day and one squad member, PSC Dale Bertoli, with a rifle, each alone on Sugarloaf freaking Hill. Which is, yeah, like the worst place in the world to be at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. Good gravy. And it's, and it's not done. Yeah. By the night of 1516 May, the presence of Day and Bertoli were well known to the Japanese, I would assume so. Persistent machine gun and rifle fire, as well as fairly accurate mortar fire, gave Day and Bertoli an absolutely sleepless night. Throughout the night, the Japanese tried to get to these two guys, but because of the steep slope on Day's side of the hill, he could hear the Japanese before he ever saw them and just kept rolling grenades down on them all night long. Um, Somebody's got to be bringing grenades and ammo up to these dudes. So they're scrounging it off of, I don't, where's it I, coming from? I don't know, but anyway. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that they're picking it off at dead guys. Yeah. It, that's the only thing I can think of because they are cut off. Like the Marines yeah. know that they're there, but they can't get to them. And Jeez. that's the, there's well, no supply line. Cause if there was, they'd have gotten them out of there or put more men up. Yeah, I would think. Yeah, he's anyway. going down m multiple times already, and every time he goes down, he's going to bring stuff back with him. He's sure. got to. Right? That's also true. How are you not? That's also true. Yeah. So, the Japanese, as the as these two guys are rolling these grenades down on the Japanese, the Japanese they take off down the hill, and they get basically illuminated by their own uh, fire. They're backlit by flares, and the, these two guys are picking these guys off as they're running away. Through the next 24 hours, Day and Bertoli kept up their firing, intermittently, obviously, on any Japanese patrols or reinforcements that came into their view. In response, the Japanese kept sending night assaults at these two guys, who in turn kept killing them all. The pitch battle between the two Marines and the Japanese went on for another evening until a runner... Finally, from the 29th Marines, reached the two-man killing crew, ordered to, quote, get the hell out. <laughs> Day and Bertoli abandoned their position of four days, mm -hmm. leaving over 100 dead Japanese behind them. Day would obviously be awarded the Medal of Honor from President Clinton in 1998. Mm -hmm. Bertoli, yeah. unfortunately, would later be killed in the action. Yeah. That is just bad to the bone man this was yeah, maybe days should have left him up there i'm sorry bill go ahead no what i was gonna say is this was days monsurabachi he did not want to leave yeah yeah i was gonna yeah. say you should just leave him up there i mean they're obviously winning mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like, yeah. i don't know that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. incredible yeah. anyway absolutely incredible so John, by now, this is, what did I say? It's May 17th? It's, yeah. 15, 16, uh, 17, 17, somewhere in the middle of May. Somewhere. We're in the rainy season here. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, now it is just coming down constantly. And there's a, a sort of a compressed series of quotes I'd just like to read from, again, from Eugene Sledge's book that that gives a sense for just how awful the conditions were here because he was fighting in exactly this same neck of the woods at this time. And he writes everywhere lay Japanese corpses killed in the heavy fighting for several feet around every corpse maggots crawled in the muck and then were washed away by the runoff of the rain. There wasn't a tree or bush left. All was open country. The scene was nothing but mud shell fire and flooded craters with their silent, pathetic, rotting occupants. The ever-present smell of death saturated my nostrils. It was there with every breath I took. I existed from moment to moment, sometimes thinking death would have been preferable. We were in the depths of the abyss, the ultimate horror of war. In the mud and driving rain before Shuri, men struggled and fought and bled in an environment so degrading 
I believe we had been flung into hell's own cesspool. Mm. God. Yeah. Just it, it, you know, we, we said it last week and we said it at the beginning, but this is reminiscent of France, world war one trench style fighting when guys yeah. are literally living amongst the corpses of not only their dead enemies, but their dead comrades as They're well. And, and it's, it's just, it's a hell on earth. That's almost, it's, it's, we can't describe it accurately. I don't think it's, I really do. It's god awful. Yeah, and Sledge makes the comment too that you know one of the Marine replacement comes into the line and and sees immediately that there are Marine dead, you know, lying around the bed. Why haven't we gone and gotten these guys? And as soon as somebody would try to do that, the Japanese would fire on them with small arms and artillery because, of course, they can see everything that is going on here from their heights up on Shuri Castle. So there's no possibility of recovering your own dead, which is tremendously demoralizing. I mean, the Marine Corps uh, prides itself that we do not leave our comrades behind. And you're in a situation here where it is just physically impossible to actually recover your own dead. And in some cases, you're wounded, too. You have to watch them succumb because there's just no way to get to them. Yeah, this is this is a particularly grisly piece of real estate. And it it has, and again, you know, it's a we're we're foreshadowing the next week's episode, but it has such an effect on these guys up here. Yeah. That, now we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. E every battle has an effect on everybody that participates in it, but Okinawa above all in the Pacific Special is casual. just yeah, really yeah. is really. Bill, yeah. you going to say something? No, I was just going to show the map again, Seth, because it kind of demonstrates how feckless. Look at all these, look at all these assaults and then yeah. retreats, assault, retreat, assault, retreat. You know, this is, th these are hardened troops here. This is not something they're going to do lightly, but, but they were, they were just achieve, failed to achieve a foothold here and, and just um, were being attrited every time they tried this. Yeah. So, Bill, what happens on May the 18th? So, Dog Company, 2nd Battalion, 28th Marines. It's their turn. They attack Sugarloaf, this time with well-coordinated ta tank support. As the Marines went up the hill, the tanks poured through a gap in the Japanese defensive line just to the south. When the Marines got to the top of the hill, what happens? The Japanese ran out of the defensive positions for a counterattack, only this time to be met by tank and machine gun fire, much to their astonishment because the tanks are to the south. The tanks moved down the, down the attacking Japanese, allowing Dog Company to be the first Marine unit to take and hold Sugarloaf. The Marines would not relinquish the ground again. Finally, we're here. The 22nd, 29th Marines had been shot to pieces, attacking Sugarloaf, forcing the commitment of the Divisional Reserve of the 4th Marines. The, this fresh unit moved into the lines, taking over the defense of Sugarloaf and simultaneously attacking Half Moon and Horseshoe. Half Moon, and, and they're both, they're, Half Moon is to the east and Horseshoe is kind of to the southwest. Yeah. So, so it's not in line here. Um, the, uh, the fresh unit moves into lines. And so the night of May 19th, they saw a massive Japanese counterattack, over 700 men, throw themselves against the 4th Marine lines and be cut down to pieces by small arms fire and incredibly accurate Marine artillery. As the sun rose the following morning, instead of a withstanding another Japanese counterattack, the field of battle, already little littered with row upon row of enemy dead, fell silent. The battle for Sugarloaf Hill was finally over at the cost of over 2,600 casualties and ah, a further mighty. 1,289 cases of combat fatigue. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Sugarloaf cost almost as many lives as Basio Tarawa that we, it was like two seasons ago, Seth. Right. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, so by May 17th at this point, 10th Army casualties all told now are almost 4,000 KIA, 
302 MIA, 18,258 wounded, and 9,295 non-battle casualties, and a lot of those are combat fatigue. Um, and again, there's a, this remarkable passage from Sledge's book where he he talks about how you know the mud was so slippery at this point that you'd be trying to come down a hill and you would slip and fall and slide down the hill. And by the time you got to the bottom, your pockets, your boots, your pants, everything was filled with a mixture of mud and water and maggots and in many cases your own vomit uh, at being you know stuffed full of that detritus. And he writes, the conditions tax the toughest I knew almost to the point of screaming. Not nor nor do authors normally write about such vileness unless they have seen it with their own eyes. It is too preposterous to think that men could actually live and fight for days and night days on end under up. such terrible conditions and not be driven insane. But I saw much of it there on Okinawa, and to me, the war was insanity. insanity. So you you can understand where these combat fatigue casualties are are coming from at this point. And we haven't really talked about the Japanese side of the equation, but the same is very much true for them, of course, on the other side of this line. Uh, and it's true even behind the lines. And so some of the accounts that we have from the girls who were in the Himayuri uh, Corps who were doing nursing duties are talking about the fact that they're oper you know, they're working in field hospitals, which were caves that were stuffed full of these crude wooden bunks where the wounded are being stacked like cordwood. And very quickly, you know, those caves descend into their own level of hell mm -hmm. of blood and pus and bodily waste and flies and maggots and lice. And these girls are being, you know, worked almost to the bone. Uh, they have practically no sleep changing the dressings, uh, feeding these wounded men, burying them when they finally die. And if you so much as step foot outside the cave, you're taking your life in your own hands, you know, even to do something as simple as trying to relieve yourself, you know, find some food, maybe running an errand over to a command post or something like that. Because as soon as you step outside, you're in the middle of the typhoon of steel and you're under the guns of Buckner's army at this point. So, you know, the Japanese are suffering equally from the same mental maladies that all of the Americans are at this point. It it truly is, you know, as they say, you know, you save the best for last. Right. You save the worst for last because it yes. really is. You know, we've talked about some really bad situations throughout this whole series that we've done. I mean, pick one, you know, honest to God. But this is the ultimate. Because it's so big. And there's so many mm -hmm. civilians involved in it, too. It's just it's much more multidimensional than a place like Peleliu, for instance, mm -hmm. where there aren't any civilians. There aren't any schoolgirls being thrown into the mix. Yeah, the, the pathos here is is really something else. And and when you when we wrap all this up next week and we wrap the Okinawa land campaign up, you're going to understand why this campaign held such heavy weight when it came to actually deciding to use the atomic bomb and invade Japan. For sure. You're yeah. going to understand. <clears throat> and, and to, to emphasize that point, John says girls. He means teenagers and preteens, right? These, if you 14. don't remember from our previous episode, these girls were basically lassoed into yeah. the doing this kind of stuff. They weren't trained for it. And they just, these are children, folks. Yeah. Right. And so, again, as you said, Seth, this all factors into what people thought was coming and right. in an invasion of Japan and the decision mm -hmm. to use the atomic bombs. So while the 22nd and 29th Marines from the 6th Division were absolutely bleeding themselves white on the slopes of these three hills that were Sugarloaf, Half Moon and Horseshoe, the 1st Marine Division, they weren't just sitting there picking their nose. They were fighting their own series of bloody encounters. The 7th Marine Regiment, after several days of fighting, had dislodged or killed the enemy around Takeshi Ridge, the first of the three Japanese defensive lines in their sector. 
After taking the ridge, the Marines held it through a series of Japanese counterattacks, which virtually eliminated the remaining soldiers of the 62nd Division. That pretty much wipes them out yeah. uh, if they were already wiped out, but this kills them almost to a man. Uh, the cost for the Marines, the 7th Marine Regiment specifically, was incredibly high, like every other place on Okinawa. In the, defi- in the fight for Dakishi, the 7th Marines lost 700 men. On May 14th, the 7th Marines launched a major attack in the direction of the next ridge, Wana. And these series of fights, Wana Draw, Wana Ridge, are the Sugarloaf Hill for the 1st Marine Division on Okinawa. This is where they really Gets run right. into it. Yeah, big time. Yep. In a coordinated attack, the 1st Marines drove towards the area where the ridge ended at a mouth at the mouth of a draw called Wana Draw. As they moved towards the draw, the Marines were bludgeoned by Japanese artillery fire that forced the Leathernecks to withdraw. General Pedro Del Valle, that we mentioned before, didn't hesitate to throw his tanks into the mix for the next assault scheduled for the following day. Laying some 1,200 yards away from the newly captured and defended Dakishi, it was expected that 1,200 yards of ground to Wana could be crossed and taken in a day at most. I'm not really sure why he's assuming this, but it is. It would take the 1st Marine Division 18 days to cross those 1,200 yards of Okinawan earth. Where he got that estimate, I do, I do not know. But you got to be optimistic a, to be a general. I mean, you know, I guess. That's, that's part of the gig, right? But I guess so, yeah. Man. Yikes. Anyway. Yeah. Bill, what happens in these 18 days? So, Seth, all three infantry regiments of the 1st Mordiv would hurl themselves against Wana Ridge and Wana Draw. The ridge fell relatively quickly in three days. Wana Draw, however, was a different story, with towering valley walls and cliff and cliffs guarding each side of a meandering valley floor covered with heavily defended caves and pillboxes. Wana Draw was referred to as dun dun dun. Death Death Valley Valley. (laughs) by those lucky enough to survive it, right? Corporal Melvin Grant, E Company, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, said later, quote, we were shot to pieces and beaten bloody. We had gone into the line with 240 men. Now we were down to 26. And there was no way we could hold our positions any longer. Manny Rivas from San Antonio said it was Death Valley, all right. We ate and slept next to bloated Japanese bodies and the bodies of our own men. The only safe place was to take cover inside Okinawa, the Okinawan tombs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Death Valley, good name. Like everywhere else on Okinawa, the Japanese at Wana were holed up in caves that were incredibly difficult to reach. The caves that could be approached, which were few, were often sealed shut with explosives by the attacking Marines, but they had suffered severe casualties in the process of doing that. The majority of the caves in Wana, the Wana complex were inaccessible, except to the Japanese, and that was by tunnel at night, improvising as they usually did when fighting entrenched Japanese. The men of the 1st Marines t- tried a different method to dislodge their stubborn enemy. Grunts from the 1st Marines manhandled barrels of napalm to the top of the ridge and draw. They, you know, stabbed the top of the barrels of napalm with knives. I'm not sure that's a very safe maneuver. It doesn't seem like that would be in the procedure manual for safe <laughs> ammunition handling, but yeah. Uh, you got to do what you got to do, man. You gotta do. So that then they roll these barrels of napalm down the draw. You know, the bloom, the bloom, the bloom, the gurgling, the napalm out as they go. The barrels inevitably found their way into or near a Japanese cave. And when they did, they were ignited by the Marines above with Willy Pete, white phosphorus. Still, despite the demolition methods, the Japanese held their positions, giving ground literally an inch at a time while inflicting terrible casualties on the old breed, the seventh Marines in particular. This reminds me of the the cave letting and all throughout the Southern South Pacific South. Yeah, this is some pretty 
nasty, nasty stuff. There's some pretty good figures here. I'm going to relate in just a second. So the seventh Marines are relieved by the first Marines because they're pretty much mm -hmm. shot to Pete. Yeah, they're done. Yeah. They're, they're done. Who now took their turn in the death Valley along with the entirety of the first Marine division's armor, mm -hmm. Sherman medium tanks and attached army flame tanks, which is just Sherman's that we call, when do we, we talk about these on, on Ewo, the Ronson yeah. lighters, they call yeah, them. Zip mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were indispensable in both their assault and direct fire support roles on May 16th as an indicator. First tank battalion fired nearly 5,000 rounds of 75 and one, 173,000 rounds of 30 caliber ammunition plus 600 gallons of napalm. That's just one tank, but good God. Yeah. That is a lot of fire. So crossing the floor of the gorge at Wana continued to be an absolutely heart-stopping race against a gauntlet of Japanese fire, and progress became incredibly, incredibly slow. Typical of the fighting was a division summary for its progress on 18 May. Quote, gains were measured by yards won, lost, then won again. Unquote. On May 20th, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Sables 3-1 improvised a different method for dislodging the Japanese. That's what you were talking about earlier, Bill, when they're dropping these napalm yeah. barrels down in these guys. Progress was being made here, gentlemen, but at a very, very frightful cost. And the fighting in and around one of the 1st Marine Division would lose nearly 200 Marines for every 100 yards of enemy territory captured. I mean, that's... That's in excess of Iwo Jima numbers here, yeah. I believe, if I remember correctly. The 7th Marines are out of the fight for the time being. The onus of the assault now lies on the 1st Marines entirely in this Wana area. An absolutely savage fighting over the next several days. The 1st Marines managed to make their way up and into Wana draw. I mean, that's... That's primal, primal casualty figures here. Yeah. So, John, there's a guy in here from your home state of yeah. Minnesota we need yes. to talk about. Yeah, yeah. this dude's it's a bad dude here. Lewis Haig from Ada, Minnesota. Do you know Ada, Minnesota is way out there? It is <laughs> uh, <laughs> way out by the North Dakota border, uh, a little to the northeast of Fargo. But yeah, that is uh, that is out there. <laughs> Let's just say for a God's country, city. as we say. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's a little little tiny town now. It's about 1,700 uh, oh, people. I was just looking that up when I saw this here in the notes that, yeah, we we're going to be talking about a good Minnesota boy. Yeah, and this dude is a bad man. Lewis Haig was a machine gunner in C-1-1 and a Peleliu veteran. Haig led his machine gun squad toward the base of one Wana's endless supply of small hills. Japanese fire slowed the assault by C Company, forcing them to stop and dig in for the night. Now, this is kind of interesting. They did, you know, as we've seen, especially around Sugarloaf, when these guys are stopped, they usually have to get the heck out of there. They usually have right. to beat feet and and pull out. And in this particular, and this goes, this shows the difference in the terrain here. As in the picture you showed of Sugarloaf, there is nothing there. Yeah. It's the hill and then flatland and then nothing. Wana at least has places to hide. Yeah, hide, for lack of a better term. As night fell, the left flank of Haig's line came under intense Japanese mortar and machine gun attacks that poured enfilading fire into his fellow Marines from several positions to Haig's left front. With members of his platoon, Haig's platoon being hit and killed all around him, he raised his head to see if he could spot where the shooting was coming from. Being on the far right of the line and not under direct fire at that time, Haig spotted two enemy positions raining fire on his platoon specifically. He ordered his machine gun squad to hold their positions and cover him. Stuffing grenades in every single pocket that he had and hanging more from his belt, he grabbed his rifle, jumped out of cover, and read headlong at the closest enemy machine gun position. Japanese immediately saw him as he ran towards the position and shifted fire to the on-rushing dude from Minnesota. As he neared the first Japanese machine gun position, Haig was struck by at least three rounds from one of the enemy weapons. Unfazed, Haig began furiously hurling grenades at the closest Japanese position, killing the occupants and destroying the automatic weapon. Upon seeing the position knocked out, the remaining Japanese machine gun pinning down Haig's company now poured fire at Haig, hitting Haig several more times. Still, the dude came on. 
As he neared the last enemy position, he threw his remaining grenades and emptied the, his rifle on the crew, killing all of them. Turned around, He then turned around and called for his squad to come forward, and as he did, he was struck by several rounds of Japanese rifle fire or machine gun fire, killing the young man. His squad and his platoon, seeing the one-man charge and obviously inspired by his incredible bravery, stood up and charged the Japanese positions, eliminating them and capturing the hill. Haig, rightfully so, is awarded the blue ribbons, blue ribbon for his self-sacrifice. What a what makes guys do things like that? That's a yeah. question I don't think you could ever answer. But I mean, just um, take the problem and solve it your own way. Yeah, a combination of fear and anger and uh you know wanting to do your best and help out your mates you know mm -hmm. we're yeah, in I a terrible that's position the, yeah john it's they do it for each other right yeah. yeah you do it for your own buddies you're not doing it for mom and apple pie that's for damn sure no no so we talked about it, but let's talk about it again some more here. The rain, as I put in the notes, rain, rain, go away, and it ain't going to go away. So while those soldiers and Marines had dealt with the, the Japanese rain. in spades since they landed on this damn rock, the one thing they hadn't had to deal with until now was the weather. It had been somewhat pleasant, really hot maybe, yes, but it had been relatively dry until the heavens started to open. Um, the monsoon season that we talked about is now here. Uh, for the first Marine Division that we just finished talking about, mired and want to draw the terrain, like John, you were talking about, these are the lines that are coming from Eugene Sledge, are covered with the dead and rotting corpses of the Japanese. Maggots the rain, everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. everywhere. The rain was so heavy that the draw at points filled up with water over 12 feet deep. Infantry units in platoon and positions in and around the draw found themselves cut off, not by the Japanese, but by water, they were now on islands, essentially. Tanks were useless. LVTs, which, by the way, are amphibious vehicles, right. became mired in the mud. And I've got footage and pictures I'll show of the mud. I mean mud, man. I mean, this is some mud here. The wounded, when these guys are hit, they actually had to be brought out one by one by their own men because nothing could get to these people, which obviously causes a lot of these Marines, if they're seriously wounded, to die because they could not get out of there fast enough. So while being shot at by the Japanese infantry and bombarded by artillery was deadly and terrifying, the mud became the grunts, and not just the grunts, the dog faces too, their worst enemy. And and there's passages are written about this throughout any book Any you read about account. yeah it's yeah. going to talk about the mud yeah it infested everything guys and i do mean everything it, your clothing, literally everything your weapons your food it's in your mouth it's in your ears it's just yeah it's disgusting there were guys and i put this in the notes but it's true they're, they're, the cigarette packs you know you, they're, they're paper packs but they're wrapped in cellophane and they're sealed there was mud inside the freaking sealed cigarette packs. How the hell that got in there? Sterling Mace actually told me about it. He's like, I'd open up my cigarettes and freaking mud in a brand new pack of smokes. He's like, how the hell did that happen? I do not know. Right. But it was literally everywhere. You could not yeah. escape it. Could not escape. It would suck the boondockers off of these dudes' feet if they moved just a few feet down the road. Yeah. They're in, you know, and I think, it, yeah, it is. And in the, in the Pacific, they show that. And, and these guys start losing their their minds over this stuff because it's infuriating yeah so let's talk about the living con go ahead john you, you're gonna say no something. i was good it's just yeah living conditions if you can even call them that um because yeah again we're not we're not living in under shelter halves or anything of, of that nature we you know the majority of the trigger pullers are sitting out here in the mud in a hole that is filling up with water and yeah, it's it's just absolutely disgusting. Um, the ground in many cases has been so chewed over by artillery fire from both sides that the corpses that might have been buried or have not been buried would be reburied or unburied, depending on, you know, what happens with the shell fire. And so there are these horrific passages, you know, it's one of the ones from Sledge's book, again, that, that made me just almost throw up in my in my boots was 
he's trying to dig an entrenchment at the top of a hill and he puts his, you know, trenching tool down into something, God damn it, and not God moving. And, and he finally realizes that he's digging into the chest of a dead Japanese soldier that's been covered over by the mud on the top of that hill. And of course, you know, he recoils in horror and yet is told by an officer who doesn't understand what's going on here, you know, keep digging. And so there's like, no, I'm not going to dig through the corpse of one of my enemies to create a hole here. This is just foul and I'm going to move someplace else. But that kind of stuff is just happening over and over uh, as the men are trying to live and fight in what Sledge calls hell's own cesspool. Yeah. And and the rain, to Bill's point earlier in the episode, it ain't stopping. It's yeah. just coming down. So these guys have no rest. You can't sleep because you're under artillery or mortar or rifle, whatever. You're under fire almost all the time. Yeah. The rain is just coming down in sheets. Everything is wet. And I do mean everything is wet. And you can't get dry because there are no dry clothes. There's... And even if you put them on within, you know, 10 minutes, minutes you're soaked again. Yeah. 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 And this is where a lot of these psych casualties really start to skyrocket here. Yeah. This is when this is the time and place in the campaign when the when the you know and you can't, fatigue skyrocket. Can't no, you get can't a hot them. meal. All these guys are eating out of cans for weeks on end. And yeah, the, as soon as you open up the can, the water is in your cans. Now you're eating sea rations with with mud and sludge in it and god knows what else i mean it's just yeah it's a vile environment one of the quotes from sledge i put in here and it comes straight from his book says quote the smell of death was everywhere it was the most ghastly corner of hell i had ever witnessed as far as i could see in the area that had been a low grassy valley with a picturesque stream meandering through it was a muddy repulsive open sore on the land choked with putrefaction of death, decay, and destruction, unquote. <sighs> so yeah. at this point, pretty much all offensive action kind of stops because nothing can move. And that includes men to an extent. Nothing yeah. can get forward. Nothing can really move forward. And it just kind of, it just kind of grinds to a halt. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, on the other side, uh, things are not going well for the Japanese. I mean, even though the, the Americans are at the end of their tether, the Japanese kind of are as well. Um, at this point, 32nd Army really can no longer withstand the cumulative pressure from both the American weight of firepower and the fact that their own casualties have been mounting, and particularly in conjunction with that failed counterattack. As Colonel Yahara remarks after the battle, I think this is a beautiful quote, overall, the situation appeared stable, but in reality, after May the 20th, it was comparable to a patient in the final stage of tuberculosis. He may look normal, but his chest cavities are hollow. The 32nd Army was basically starting to fall apart. And so Yahara is now already beginning to scheme I, we've got to get out of here, that it makes no sense for us to continue to fight on the Shuri line. We're just going to be annihilated here. And as soon as we are annihilated, this campaign is over with. And our orders are to draw this campaign out as long as possible. And so what he's hoping is that if we can pull the remainder of 32nd Army out and move it back to a rear position down on the very southern tip of Okinawa, that there's at least a possibility that the Americans might decide, you know what, just leave them down there. If if the Japanese are now out of artillery range of the American airfields, maybe the Americans will decide to just, you know, draw a cordon around our final enclave and leave us the hell alone, the way they had done in places like Bougainville and to an extent on Luzon in the Philippines. You know, that's obviously going to prove to be a vain aspiration, but that was one of the straws that he's that he's grasping at. Um, and so while he's making these deliberations, there are still, though, diehards within 32nd Army, including the commander of the 62nd Division, despite the fact that his division has, in essence, ceased to exist, who are determined to fight and die on Shuri because, you know, this is where the, the bulk of his men have laid down their lives. But the bottom line is that um, 
Yahara now has enough political capital within 32nd Army that his vision is is the one that comes through the staff deliberations. And so what 32nd Army is going to do is put in a series of local counterattacks to pin the Americans in place. And while that is going on, the remainder of 32nd Army is going to get up and out of the Shuri line positions and move to the south, as he called it, an offensive retreat. <laughs> and it works, too, to an extent. Bill, what happens on May 26th? Yeah, so the weather clears long enough for some Piper Cub re recon planes to take to the air and see what's going on. American pilots flew, saw a long column of Japanese troops. Where were they headed? To the north to attack? Nope. They're in the open, marching south. Along, the troops were, along with the troops were civilians, it was noted. The news of what appeared to be a retreating enemy was passed to ships offshore. The cruiser USS New Orleans, CA-32, your second favorite ship, Seth, and BB-34 <laughs> opened fire on the retreating enemy columns with loads of shells. In the breaks of weather, Marine Corsairs from Yontan took to the skies and strafed and bombed the same columns as they made their way south. Leaflets dropped by American aircraft in the days previous had instructed the civilians to dress in white so as not to be targeted. And while American pilots made mention of purposely missing people in white clothing, American pilots said they were purposely missing people in white clothing. To. Undoubtedly, they killed a great many civilians unintentionally. So we know they Ushiji, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he assumes that during the withdrawal, he still had at least 50,000 men at his disposal. However, because of American artillery strikes, airstrikes, naval gunfire, retreating column, uh, the Japanese, the casualties suffered in ways that where they couldn't count the number of casualties they had really suffered. They, had a, they estimated 15,000. What, what really happened was Ushijima's force had been reduced not to 50,000, but 30,000, maybe less. At this stage, an estimated, get this, 62,000 Japanese troops had died in the fight for this island. Guys, 62,000 yeah. KIA on the Japanese side. Yeah, which is more than the combined garrisons of Saipan, Guam, and Tinian combined. So, yeah, this is, this is a very, very heavy defeat on the part of the Japanese, and it ain't over yet. The other thing that we know happens is despite uh, the better intentions of those pilots, you know, we're bombarding these south moving uh, columns using naval sure. gunfire, which does not discriminate uh, yep. for people wearing white. Nope. And uh, if you look at the civilian accounts, this is really where the civilian body count starts to go dramatically north is in, in the process of this retreat, because these people are out in the open. They're exposed to the same levels of, of American firepower that their military is, and it it's just horrific. They, you know, there are thousands and thousands of civilians that are killed in the course of this withdrawal. And I think we need to make it clear, and I know we've we've talked offline about this, and, and I'm not disparaging anybody, but at this point in the event, the American command structure has had enough. Yeah. They're they're going to do whatever they can to save civilian lives. Undoubtedly, there's no question there. However, if the Japanese military, yes, and if the Japanese military is in the open, civilians be damned. Yeah, because we're we're done with this, and I mean there is no question, no question that our artillery fire, as you said, naval gunfire, and strafing aircraft killed thousands of Okinawan, and I mean it, it ratchets up, but I'm going to talk right now at this stage, yep. killed thousands of Okinawan civilians, because not everybody, I'm sorry, had a white shirt or whatever to yeah. wear. Yeah. And, you know, a, a moving figure from, you know, 4,000 feet in a Corsair cruising by at 350 miles an hour, you can't tell. Can't tell. Uh -uh. And, and it gets really squishy, too, because, of course, we know a lot of the Okinawan conscripts who are, you know, officially in the Japanese military. They didn't want to be there either. 
Right. In a lot of cases, these are these are young boys who have been dragged out of the high schools. And congratulations, you're now a member of the Signal Corps. Um, so yeah, it's 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 the beginning of a of a really dark time for the Okinawan civilian population, a time that they are incredibly bitter about even to this day, not only um bitter towards the Americans who, you know, they're under the American guns. Understandably, they're also bitter towards the Japanese military, which placed them in this position right. uh, and who are not, in many cases, allowing them to surrender or to move out of the way. They are corralling these people and moving them along with them. Of course, a lot of these people as well have been infected by Japanese propaganda, and they think that their chances are better with their own military than with our military, who are going to put them in the pot or rape them or whatever they think that we're going to do. So it's just, it's a nightmare for Okinawa's civilian population. Rushing to cut off the retreating enemy, Buckner's 7th ID and 6th Marine Division actually missed the opportunity to do that very thing. When probes towards Shuri ran into the rear guard of guard. roughly 5,000-ish that Jed, that Ushijima, well, technically Yahara, had left behind, the stiff resistance provided by these guys uh, forced the Marines and the Army to go, wait, hold on, it's might not, they might not all be gone. Yeah, we have uh, to however, make a more deliberate advance than we wanted to. Exactly. Yep. Ex exactly. So Yahara's plan works perfectly. Absolutely. It allows these people to get out of Dodge, mostly yep. anyway. Uh, on May 27th, however, irrefutable evidence was found in the clear entry of the 6th Marine Division into Naha. Uh, the small city had essentially been, I mean, there were some guys there for, for sure, but it had essentially been abandoned by the Japanese. And at now, Buckner's like, oh, yep, they're going. And it, he races to catch the retreating enemy, but it's too late. These guys are gone regardless the Marines do move into Shuri with the old breed securing Shuri Castle on May 29th. And John, Ushima and them, they just barely missed it, didn't they? Yeah, they they had left just the day before. Uh, we're looking for opportunities, gaps during the shell fire, and they get out of Dodge and they march south. I should mention, too, with regards to Naha, yes, Naha town was abandoned, but there's a group of naval troops that are down in that neck of the woods. And one of the most extensive set of fortifications down there is actually Admiral Ota's command tunnel complex that is in a, in a hill uh, a little bit outside of town. And there's going to be some pretty stiff fighting down there, too. But, yes, yeah. the, the bottom line is that by the time you get to the end of May, the Shuri line has finally been abandoned. Mm -hmm. But it's still not over because we got to. As we know, the as Yahara wanted us to do, he wanted to coordinate, you know, coordinate that island section of the island off and let it wither on the vine. That is not how we roll at this stage of the war. We're ready yeah. to get this over with it to any and all costs. Yep. And that's exactly what is going to happen as we wrap up the land campaign next week. Guys, is there anything else you want to bring to this to the table here? Or are we no you know, the only thing I'm I'll say, Seth, is there's a little bit of a teaser for next week. Is I was in Okinawa around nine years ago, and I was witness to a pretty remarkable conversation where I was asking one of the locals about the battle and how it affected their family. And I got a pretty good rant from one of the older persons in the, in the uh, present during the conversation. The rant wasn't really surprisingly against the Imperial Japanese Army or the Americans, the combatants, the rant was against a young person in their family. And the rant was all about the fact that the young, these young people today, you know, that kind of thing, we've all had those conversations. They don't, they've forgotten what we went through. They, they don't care about the, the turmoil, the heartache, the, the losses, the suffering, they don't care about any of that anymore. You know, they're only living in their own heads. And, and it was very clear that the hurt was still very yeah. raw by this person. And, and, but, the, but the fire had kind of been redirected at their own, which was very surprising. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Well, with that um, uplifting, uplifting note... Yes, <laughs> we're so widely noted for that. 
Indeed. Yes. Indeed. No, we're not talking about horseshoes and rainbows here. So, yeah, anyway, we're going to shut up for this week and we'll wrap this ultimate battle up next week. Uh, just the land campaign. We haven't even touched the, the air slash sea campaign yet, and we will. So with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating, review, and all that jazz. Da, 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 da. If you want to see the video of this, if you're not already looking at it, look at our YouTube channel. If you got a question or a comment, do send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. I'm not, I've caught up and then I fell behind again, but I'm working my way through them. Um, and John, again, tell us about your your website um yeah so my link my, rather my link well yeah it should be down at the bottom I, i'm in the process of building that page right now so i don't actually know what the url is or even actually where i'm going to be hosting it um but <laughs> in any case yeah anyone who would be so kind as to sign up for uh the mailing list for my forthcoming book which is tentatively entitled 1942 crux of war i would be incredibly grateful for your email address thank you Yep. And we'll do it. We'll make sure that will happen. And by the time this airs, it will be live. So we'll be good to go. God willing. Yeah, I'm glad God, yeah. I'm glad you overrode my recommendation for your title, 1942 Fulcrum of the War. Uh, which, well, <laughs> and actually, you know, Churchill also has, you know, the hinge of fate. That was that was the name for his go. 1942 volume. So maybe I'm I'm stealing from Churchill. I don't know. But mm -hmm. there are well, worse no people to steal from. True. Yeah. There Churchill was a pretty, indeed. pretty interesting cat for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> in many ways. But anyway, regardless of that, uh, I want to thank you all for listening in on our conversation and we will see you next week. Once again, my name is Seth Paird and I want to thank you again, John, as always, my friend, for being here with us. Appreciate it. Always a good yeah. time. Yep. Bill, bring us home. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>